And our first speaker will be John Sherman, who is uh, the staff at the Anycat Beamline, and he will review tools which are available there for data collection. So please, let's start. So today I'm going to go over some of the tools um, that we use at Beamline, software tools and hardware. Um, and we're going to talk about optimizing data collection for micro refresh Beamlines. So I say this the old way, but it's not really the way. So when I started, it wasn't that long ago, but this is how you would collect data at Beamline. Um, basically, you would just stick crystal up and put the 180 degrees. This is also kind of referred to as the American way. Um, <laughs> there was never anything as a strategy. We knew about it, but we really didn't know how important they were. Um, every once in a while, you collect a couple of snapshots. Um, most of the time, you already screened your crystals beforehand, so you already knew what you were going to get. Um, so you just stuck it, collected the data, and then you didn't want to take the time to do the strategy. You didn't want to take the time to process the data. So you just people at the wait till you got home and do it all. And it's highly inefficient. This comes down to the slide that uh, Steve showed yesterday on the, this, the beginning of his second talk about how when James mentioned that there was 98% of the data sets people collect at the game line that don't get, um, they're, they're not assigned to a paper and they weren't published. And, that, and it's just because of inefficiencies. So the reason is people tend to just when they do, do it that way, they tend to just collect the same data sets over and over again. They'll have 20 crystals of the same thing, and they'll collect 20 data sets all within about a tenth of an inch from each other. Um, none of the data sets are any better than each one. Um, and it's just, it's highly inefficient. Then when you get home, you, you can't figure out which one's the best data set. So the other, the other reason with it is, is um, you're not getting the best data quality from each crystal. Um, Say you have P422 symmetry, you only need 45 degrees of data, they collect 180 degrees. So you turn the flux down um, you know, five times less than what you could hit if you just collected 50 degrees of data. So you're not getting the maximum dose that you can even get the crystal the best data. So in the end, you get the, a lot of redundant data, but then you never really, you never really collect the data the right way. Um, and it's, just, it, it's just not efficient. Um, the other issue is you can get, it can hinder structure solution. Um, so my boss, uh, Steve Bielek, came to collect data. And this was actually at the beginning of when we started Rapid. I'll talk about Rapid in a little bit, but we automatically collect Steve to the strategies. So he did this to a point shoot method where he just stuck a crystal up, collect 180 degrees of data. And this was a, a Selena Met crystal um, that he had that day haven't solved before. And, uh, ran through the SAD pipeline and found a couple sites and the maps looked okay. So then he used the anomalous strategy, collected it in the same crystal. Um, he found more sites and maps looked better. And then we used uh, the mini cap on the line to buy the pairs in the same frame. Collected a third data set on the same crystal and maps were immaculate found every site. So if you collect the data right the first time, it can really help you in the end. And, uh, and nowadays with people's structures being a little more difficult, um, it pays to actually do it correctly from the beginning, instead of trying to fight the problems afterwards. Um, the other problem with this method is if you have issues like twinning and um, you assume the symmetry was one and it's not the correct symmetry, then you don't have enough data. So when I say typical data collection here, I'm talking um, what most people do with Beamline. And uh, in this case, they want to collect a complete data set from a single crystal with maximum flux. Uh, before any significant radiation damage occurs. And this is in general for pretty much any beam line. Um, I'll get more typical into the, or more focused into the anti test stuff in a couple slides. But the proper way, it takes a little bit longer to set up the data set. Um, of course, nowadays with these new detectors, you can collect the data set in one or two minutes. And there's a tendency to just say, well, it's only going to take me one or two minutes, why don't you collect the data? And, I mean, it's just, it, does, it doesn't make sense. It's not efficient. I mean, sure, it, it's only one to two minutes, but I mean, back in the days when it took longer, would you have done it? No. So, 
I mean, it's easier to go through screens because they'll find the best ones and then click on the best ones. Um, so, first thing is properly center the crystal. And this might sound stupid, but people will, if you're just taking snapshots, you get it pretty close. That's fine. You're just trying to see how well it diffracts. But when you want to collect the data set, um, especially if you have a micro beam light, you want to make sure it's centered. Um, and this kind of refers back also to inverse beam experiments. So, um, for people who don't know, so inverse beam experiments when you're trying to do anomalous data sets. So, you collect 20 degrees of data, rotate the crystal to 180, collect 20 degrees of data, go back to 20, collect 20 to 40, and then go back from, then go to 200 to 220. So you're going to collect uh, the bifid pairs within a pretty close uh, time frame. So that way it kind of minimizes the radiation damage from across the whole crystal uh, from the time from when you started to when you got the bifid pair. Um, if you don't have your crystal center properly, when you rotate that 180 degrees and you got a small beam, the intensity differences is going to be huge compared to the 1 to 2% that you're looking for your anomalous signal. So it's going to completely erase that. I mean, sure, there's scaling to try to fix that when the data set, but I mean, if you get it centered right, then the differences should be a lot less. So you really have to get your crystal centered properly. Um, as I mentioned before, it might benefit from using a mini Kappa. Um, Anomalous, I really like if you have at least a two-fold axis, crystallographic axis, and you can get the bifid pairs in the same frame and collect them across. That way you don't have to worry about getting them within the same time because they're on the same frame. Uh, that's really the best case. Um, of course, you can use mini kappa for a lot of other issues. Other things. Uh, most people do it if you have a long axis, you try to get the long axis parallel or nearly parallel to the spindle axis. You don't want to get a right parallel because then you have a huge point region, but you want to get it off a little bit. And in our beam line, we have a lot of automated tools that do this. And the next thing is make sure you follow your strategy. If, you, if the strategy says you only need 45 degrees of data, you can do a little bit more. You can do 60 degrees, but you don't need 180 degrees or 200 degrees. You'd rather hit the crystal harder and get the maximum flux and spots you can from your crystal in that short amount of time than, than you know, just blasting it and, and getting a bunch of extra frames you don't need. I mean, you can cut them off at the end anyway, but. It's, it's just it's better from the beginning to get your completeness up quicker. So the goals at any cat, um, these are kind of our beamline goals, our beamline scientists. So we want you guys to work as efficiently as possible, and we want you to collect the best data possible. And at any cat, we try to automate as many um, common routines as possible, um, such as using the robot auto mounter. Um, there's a lot of uh, online software tools that we can go over. It will automate some functions that usually it took before a long time to get everything set up. Um, through Rapid, we give you um, automatic data uh, strategies, data collection strategies. Uh, we'll go over that. And we also automate the mini map alignment. And this might sound kind of minor, but you can amazed at how difficult it is to get three axes lined up to not get your crystal out of the prior screen. So we automate all this function through, and it only takes a few seconds to do it. So. Um, kind of simplifies everything so you can get it uh, use the beamline to the maximum build capability. So collect the best data possible. Um, we want to find and characterize your crystal. Find, what I mean is obviously you got like something like cubic taste where you have an opaque solution, you don't know where the crystal is in the drop. Um, so we have some tool, tools called the practical alignment where we can find the crystal. Characterize the crystal. If you have a large crystal, we want to figure out where on that crystal is the best place to collect the data. Um, we'll go over all those tools. We want you to use this information, these tools that are available at the line um, to collect the best data. And um, we also provide, we call it real-time data collection statistics. Obviously with the blast detector, uh, it's very difficult to keep up in real-time, although Nick Sauter will talk about it later about uh, dials, which hopefully will speed that up. Uh, currently in the e beam line, which is a Q315, if you're taking one second exposure, it's only about 10 frames behind. So that way when you see you have a complete data set, you just stop the data set. Um, and all these goals require modern hardware um, and software, and so for that reason we're always updating and upgrading. So when you guys come to the line, we always give you a little tutorial at the beginning. That's because we're always making changes. And speaking of changes, the long way to sample, you all to sample and you're talking about it. Um, this is something that we've been pushing for for a long time. So our old robot had four tucks, which was kind of a pain for us because we had to come in the middle of the night to change tucks. 
Um, so the new robot holds 14 pucks or 224 samples. It's in the same footprint as Dylan, but you can see that the light in it is much, much brighter. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a little bit shallower, so you can actually see the samples um, a lot better. And uh, we don't have the... Um, So we replaced the air slide with the pneumatic slide. So in this robot, before the old robot would rotate and translate, um, and we were having some issues with one of the translation motors. But this one, all it does, the, the door just spins. And then we cut a slit in the lid so that the pneumatic drive can actually go down in any position and grab the sample. Uh, so this actually just got mounted last week. And so uh, it's being used by the first user, I think, today. Uh, so hopefully there's not too many problems with it going on right now. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's a huge step up for us, especially but that way when you guys come, we can just throw all the boxes at once. Don't worry about it. Wasting time switching boxes. Um, and I, I alluded to before, Rapid. So this is our, our software that we use on the mine that uh, David, Frank, and myself wrote. Um, it actually stands for Rapid Automated Processing of Data, which it actually does a lot more than that now. Originally, we wrote it just to basically give you a strategy um, and process the data, but we've added a bunch of extra pipelines to speed things up. Um, as I said before, it does automatic uh, automatic indexing and strategy, and I'll talk about that, I'll show you some slides. It does mini map alignment automatically, it only takes a, about one or two seconds. Um, processes the data. Uh, we have a data analysis pipeline, which I use. Um, I kind of monitor when people are collecting data, so if I see issues with uh, crystals and stuff, I'll come out and let them know, so that way they can uh, hopefully solve the structure. Um, well, I also wrote pipelines for uh, molecular replacements, and it uses uh, shellx. Um, and so there's also, since it uses shellx, so you can also add SIR, MAN, Cirrus. Um, those are already written in there, but it, it hasn't been implemented well yet mainly because it's not really a priority. Um, people don't really collect those kinds of data sets too much anymore. Um, so the PIs can log in and watch what's going on in the line, sometimes to the detriment of the uh, postdocs and grad students. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they start collecting data and the phone rings and they're saying, what are you doing? Go back and collect on the previous crystal. So, but the nice thing also is it saves everything, so that way when you guys go home, Everything's in chronological, reverse chronological order. You can see which crystals will data fractures to where your data sets are. And all the results are tarred up in, your, in the process folder. Um, so you take it all back home with you. So this is what the interface looks like. Um, I'm not going to go over this too much because uh, Frank's going to go over this. Uh, I just have a couple slides. Uh, but this is uh, basically what it looks like. So it gives you the, the space group and unit cell, uh, and then the, the regular strategy, and then the anomalous strategy. And every time you collect a data set, it comes up in the, the top one. So the black ones are single frames, and the pairs are in uh, rose color. If they're grayed out, that means that it actually failed for the uh, finding the auto index. It's actually really good at auto indexing. Um, and I'll talk about it in the next slide, but um, we get a lot of diverse crystals at the beam line, as you can imagine. So just using a regular peak search and trying to pick doesn't really work. Uh, for every crystal. So uh, came up with a little bit different way of doing it. Um, you can also reprocess the data. So it was P4, this is Thomas, and so obviously it's 422. So you could uh, rerun this the pipeline into a 422 strategy. Um, and then the green ones are actually from the mini path alignment. I'll show you that a little bit later. Um, you can also, as uh, Phil talked about yesterday, there's also a pipeline from the Moscow. So if you have a previous data set, you can click on it. Um, and set it as a reference data set, we call it. So that way, we can take a new snapshot, it'll automatically give you the strategy to finish the previous data set for the first crystal. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of functions, and if people want to, I can tell you all the details, but I don't want to spend so much time on it right now. Um, so, this is the pipeline, the way it works. Um, hopefully, Frank doesn't show the slide. So uh, th what I do is I, I launch six different labels with different peak pick settings. Um, and then it, I, everything's parallelized. So it runs on separate cores. 
Um, and then I take all the results and sort by the highest uh, metric symmetry, um, run it through red dose, and then I launch several different uh, strategies because sometimes the best fails with the mean factor error. So what I do is I rerun the boss film to cut the resolution by one angstrom, two angstrom, three angstrom, and then launch best. This is all done in parallel processing, so it only takes about 20 seconds to run through the whole pipeline. Um, and then there's kind of a priority. So th this one would be first, and then if that one fails, then I do the next one, the next one, the next one. And if that all fails, then I just give the last one strategy. And um, so basically, you're going to get strategy as long as you can uh, index the crystal. And, and it works actually really well. All right, the goal is to make sure if we can do it by hand, even if we can change stuff, we want to type up, we'll do it automatically. So this is the, uh, the interface for the mini kappa. Um, all you do is right click on a, one of these uh, auto indexing, say mini kappa alignment. You can choose the, as I mentioned before, the byte that bears in the same frame, uh, long axis parallel to the spindle, or what Sandor is, runs through stack. Sandor also calls it smart, where it's tilted a little bit to minimize the line region. Or you can align um, if the alignments for all the axes along the spindle, uh, or you can split axes. Uh, and then to make it simplify, all you do is double click on any one you want, and it sends those coordinates directly to the beam line. And on the beam line, there's a button that says align. So you would just do that. It automatically will uh, go to that position, keeping the crystal in the cryo stream as it goes. So for the beam line control software, this is uh, some of Malcolm stuff. Um, Basically, there's, I kind of categorize this in, uh, it's actually an old slide. But, um, just kind of scary. It's the wrong version of the PowerPoint, so hopefully we'll, we'll have the next slide correct. Uh, but there's uh, finding crystals, there's the fractal alignment. I'll show you what that is. Uh, it's basically when we grid scan across the crystal. Um, and then included view is, uh, so when people loop up crystals, they tend to loop up bunch of cryosolving with it. So if you can see the crystal in the face of it, that's fine. When you turn 90 degrees, you get kind of a lensing effect. So it looks like it's either on the top or the bottom. So the included view will basically take a bunch of shots. Uh, once you've already lined it up this way, it shoots it up this way so we can figure out where it is in that position. Uh, so the way around this, I tell people this is the beam line all the time. When you loop up your crystals, turn the loop on its side and tap it on the cover slip once or twice, and all the extra cryo comes right off. So then you have a nice loop with very little cryo, and then you won't have to worry about the lensing effect. Um, you know, if you hit it too many times, obviously the crystal will come out. So just tap it like once, and then you should get rid of the cryo. Um, so this is the diffractive alignment. Um, so what we do is we take a picture of the, um, you see your loop, you grab it, you put a box around it, and then we have some imaging software which will know where the actual loop is. That way, it will only take snapshots where there's actually something there. We'll shoot it in, that, in this extra region down here, so it speeds up a little bit. Um, this was actually just Malcolm's work on this on the last downtime, and with the plus detector, this is really, really fast. Um, I think there's a, there's a movie in here that shows it from before. Um, now, I mean, it buzzes across it really, really fast. In fact, we had to um, modify the distal server that we had so to keep up with the results. Um, but this is basically how you set it up. It, um, on the remote interface, you don't have to fill out all this information. Um, but uh, I, you know, I'm not even really going to go into this. But um, this is basically what it does. It does a grid screen across the crystal and then it gives you the statistics um, from distal to let you know uh, where it is. And I think that's on the next slide. So this is just a view of Real time. And you can see, you'll see the diffraction come up. I can't remember if this is a thaumatin or something that's in there, so it kind of makes it obvious what it was. Um, so, if people have crystals in cubic face and it's the membrane protein, you can run this. The course of course, it's a memory protein. You're lucky to get any fraction anyway. But <laughs> you're going to see when you're paying attention, you, you can see where it is. It also will color code uh, the circles to say where the fraction was. And 
the darker the color is, the uh, stronger the fraction was. Yeah, so this, these are the little color grades. So we're working on a different way of presenting this, so it's uh, a little bit more obvious and looks better than this, but basically the, you'll see the little circles where it is, and also you get all the statistical statistics for each one of those. And you can click on any one of these, and then it'll center the, the crystal right in that spot. So the next thing we do is uh, characterize our crystals. So, um, we need to figure out, do the crystals diffract the same on one end versus the other end? Um, and where, where are the good parts, where are the bad parts? Well, what I see all the time with beam line is when you have a big, long crystal, and you see, I always shoot crystals on the, on the tips. So if you shoot at the tip and it's a single diffraction, you start moving it in, you start seeing another diffraction pattern. You go to the other tip, you'll see a single diffraction pattern. It doesn't necessarily mean that's the same crystal. So a lot of times it's two crystals growing together. So if you start your data set, you want to do like a, a continuous vector scan, which I'll talk about, but you have to know where that one crystal ends and the other one, otherwise you're going to be, there's going to be a bunch of spots and they're not there because you're on a different crystal. Um, so you want to figure out exactly where you want to collect your data. So the raster snap, what it will do is, this picture here. So, what we normally do is we set up a vector. So you do a three click on one end of your crystal, hit save, do a three click on the other end of the crystal, hit save. It doesn't have to be right at the end, there's some insets that we can adjust to make the vector longer or shorter. Um, and then we can do an alignment where you can just say take 10 shots along that vector. And then it gives you a, a plot and also the table similar to what I showed before. Um, so you can see this is a number of uh, spots, I believe, or a number of big bracket spots. <coughs> So you can see where the best part of the crystal is in this. Now, if you have multiple lattices in there, it's going to show you a bunch of extra spots, and that may confuse this. Um, so I'm working on uh, writing a labeled server similar to this little server, so it'll be able to index it so you'll know it's a single lattice. Um, and then these are some of the other tools which I'll show on the other side. This is another view of the diffractive alignment. This is kind of an older one where the, um, the other one he did was a little better. So, the next thing we do is obviously collect the data once we figure it out. Um, so there's continuous vector scan, which some beam lines call helical scans, or discrete vector scan, which means basically like 20 frames here, translated 50 microns, like another 20 frames, and so on across the crystal. The continuous vector scan is every every frame to a slight translation. Um, and these tools are probably available in several other beam lines. So if you don't like the other beam line, make sure you ask your beam line scientist or whoever you're going to ask them if they have tools with some of this. They probably do, um, but they may call them something else. But the goal is here to make sure you guys collect the best data you can from that um, And then, of course, from here, as I mentioned before, you want to make sure you want to collect the best part of the crystal. So this is the continuous vector scan. Um, basically, all these little circles represent separate uh, images, so it's going to put every image is going to do a slight translation. This is the way we set it up. Again, um, it's a lot of parameters, but it's actually not as complicated as it looks. So for some reason, there's two omegas in here, uh, but this is the offset, so if you want to extend the vectors in either direction, you can adjust it here. Um, and then it's basically the same data set parameters that you can set up. So 180 frames, 20% transmission, 0.2 degree, delta omega, 0.2 seconds, and 500 millimeters. Um, and I think there's a ruby of this same crystal. Yeah. So this is actually a ribosome crystal, I believe. And the uh, movie shows the diffraction. This is in real time. So you can see it doesn't take very long to collect the whole data set. And you'll see some of this lensing effect here in a second, where it looks like the crystal is not hitting its crystal, but you can tell by the diffraction it actually still is. And a little red circle in here is actually where the beam is. That's it. So that's how fast it takes, it takes to collect the data set. And as you collect it, this is what the statistics come out. So the, the pipeline is just a aimless table. Um, and 
it keeps up in real time. So another thing about this is really handy is if somebody's coming with a bunch of metal through this and they don't know if the metal's actually in there, when you collect the data set, if you collect, collect data set pretty quick, you can find out in your group that it actually has sites. So um, you would look over here at the, uh, I always look at the anomalous correlation. So I, I usually think about 20%, 30% overall is usually a pretty good sign. Obviously, the higher the better. Um, and you want to see it's higher in the low res bin than it tapers off in the high res bin. Um, anomalous slope, I, I, honestly, you know, I, I, that number can be like 0 0.01 and still be fine, or 1.5 and still be fine. It's a comparison of the anomalous signal to the, to the standard deviations overall. So, Grading one is good, but one is still reusable sometimes. Okay. <laughs> um, What's nice is that you can you can get the you can know when you're right if you collect the data set. And people will tend to if they have like five different five derivatives, it's five crystals of the same derivative. Like one. If you don't have a signal, go to the next derivative. You may have done I always tell when they hit the ones first you get the longest soaks with for the highest concentration. Um, but you can always come back later on and shoot the rest of the samples. Um, if you can't find any derivatives that, that are, have metals found. Uh, but this is a quick way to go through and make sure that you can see if you have the metal bound in the derivative. So this is kind of a summary <coughs> to improve your efficiencies when you're collecting data. So um, screen crystals first before collecting data sets. So that's another thing people like to do. They say, now, this is, I should preface this a little bit. So if you're doing something where you're just trying to get one data set, you brought in like 10 bucks, and you see a crystal that diffracts, but the crystal when it diffracts and you see it. But if you are if you have a bunch of different crystals, the same thing, and you're trying to get the best data set, screen through those the, all the similar crystals, and then uh, figure out which ones you want to collect the data set on. And never collect your best crystal first. Um, People will do it. The other thing we used to do is they would put their first crystal up and they'd say, oh, I got a lot of crystals that are better than this. And then they used to take it down and never freeze it. And then they'd spend the rest of the day trying to find a crystal to compare to the first one that they killed. Um, you always want to screen your crystal and figure out which one's the best. I always tell people to collect on the second or third best first because you have no idea how much flux they're going to take um, before they die. So the key here is to, you want to get a complete data set for the first, so set the flux low, 7 to 10% transmission. Um, collect a complete data set. If the crystal is still alive and working fine, then turn it up to like 10%, 15%, 20%. Collect the data set, this is all additive. So at the end of that one, if it's dead, then you know you could have collected a 25 or 30% data set um, on the same crystal. So you got to use this information then when you go on to different, to your next crystal before you uh, sorry, it's that way you don't want to do the first crystal and kill it. Um, and yeah, that's what I just said. And then um, yeah, so just make sure you, you, you never hit the first crystal first with what you did. So and these are kind of acknowledgments to everybody. So I, I think Malcolm since the, the head, head, one of the head people like that, uh, any cat. Um, he gave you the movies that I just showed you. Um, I want to thank, thank uh, Frank and David for the rapid work that we've been working on. Um, and some of the other programmers that are here that I've been looking about keywords. Um, to make, I, for rapid, I try to split up functions if it takes too long in your program. So I want to do just part of it. Um, so some of the programs have added, programmers and developers have added keywords to just be part of the functions that way I can all the pieces I'm putting together myself. Um, or if I need to modify something, you know, they add extra keywords for me, and I appreciate that. Um, so if there's any questions, anything? <coughs>